Anybody here? Anybody hear that? Is that any better? Can you hear the sound okay now? Real. So we'll make a start. I don't know what. Don't know what that was. Apologies, Sue, if it's made you deaf. It wasn't quite that loud in here. But <laughs> um, we'll we'll make a start. Lovely, lovely to see you. Um, I've took my bookmark out. So we're on chapter twenty this evening of this book that we've been looking at, the attributes of God by A. W. Pink. This week's chapter is called "The Gifts of God." Now you may think that's a bit of a strange title when um, we've been looking at actually the character and the the attributes that make God God. But actually, as we read through this, we'll see that everything that we've been looking at so far, that, that, that this is an outpouring, if you like, of God's character to his people. So everything that we're going to read about, all the gifts, I think there's seven in all, uh, yeah, seven gifts that it highlights in this chapter. Just as we read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, where it talks about normal fathers being wicked would give good gifts to the children, how much more would the Heavenly Father give to those who ask him here he is a giving god he gives gifts to his children and all these gifts that we're going to read about are all gifts to his people and it's amazing to read the things that we're going to read that god even though we don't deserve a thing as we've been reading week after week after week is merciful and is kind in the fact that he provides everything that we need in terms of our relationship with him so we we can't make our relationship work out of our own offerings and our own gifts to him but he enables us through the gifts that he gives to us to have that wonderful relationship restored through Christ and through the gifts which come through Christ himself as we read in the book everything every gift that we received is purchased by the work of Christ at the cross and we'll read that soon so let's make a start. Let's just pray before we start, as we normally do each week. Father God, we just thank you again that we're able to come around your word and that we're able to come to a book which you have, have provided through the hands of a man which you have used throughout throughout the centuries. And we ask that, Heavenly Father, you would help us to understand these things tonight, that you would bring enlightenment by the power of your Holy Spirit into our lives, that as we study your word and as we read the passages in this book, that we will understand, Father, what it is that you have actually given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, that it's not just about our sins being forgiven, but that you have given us everything that is, that is required for this life that you have called us unto, this special relationship that we have, that we are actually heirs of what, what we have in Christ and that we become your sons through the gifts that you have given us yourself through your hands. And so, Father, just help us to understand, help us to recognise, help us to to question um, our relationship with you and help us to have a deeper and more fulfilled understanding of our relationship, not based on head knowledge, Father, but through experiential and experimental um, experiences in our own life. Father, we hand this evening over to you and ask that you bless it and use it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So again, as per normal, if you want to make a comment, please do in the comments box. I'll keep an eye out for them, uh, try to answer them, try to respond as much as I can. This is not just about um, not just about me talking and reading a book. This is about you as a, as a congregation and you as a people, obviously put, having your input over, over the internet as we're doing it at the moment. Um, until we've completed this book which is probably about two or three weeks time so the attributes of god for those who have not been with us before back to front a book by a w pink and we are on now chapter 20 the gifts of god and it opens up like this a giving god what a concept to our regret our familiarity with it often dulls our sense of wonderment at it there is nothing that resembles such a concept in the religions of heathendom. 
So A.W. Pink is telling us there that when we look at all the other religions, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Muslim, whether it's Hindu, nobody, none of those religions present a God that is giving. And it goes on to tell us that very much the contrary, their deities are portrayed as monsters of cruelty and greed, always exacting painful sacrifices from deluded devotees. But the God of the scripture is portrayed as the Father of mercies, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. That's 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. It is true that he has his own rights, the rights of his holiness and proprietorship. Nor does he rescind them, but rather enforces them. But what we would cont contemplate here is something which transcends reason and had never entered our minds to conceive. The divine claimer is at once the divine meter. He required satisfaction of his broken law and himself supplied it. And that is a, it's a, it's an absolute mind boggling statement that, you know, in the Old Testament, God gave the law and he said, in order for you to be right with me, you have to keep this law which we know by the hand, by our own human hands it's impossible for us to keep the law perfectly. And what it's saying there is that, that the, divine, um, the divine law which God given, he actually supplied the, the satisfaction to it himself. So he is both the requirer and he is the, the supplier of his, own, of his own requirements. His just claims are met by his own grace. He who asked for sacrifices from us made the supreme sacrifice for us. God is both the demander and the donor, the requirer and the provider. What a statement. Our God is such a wonderful and magnificent God that he, although he requires of us, he is the one that supplies our every, our every need on our behalf. Wonderful. And so we move on to the seven gifts which a, a, a Tozer um, writes about in this book. Firstly, the gift of his son. Of the old language of prophecy announced, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Isaiah 9 verse 6. Accordingly, the angels announced to the shepherds at the time of his advent, unto you is born this day. A saviour. Luke 2 verse 11. The gift was a supreme exemplification of the divine benignity. So I've made a little note there about what exactly that means. So the supreme exem the su I can't even get my mouth around it. The supreme exemplification of divine benignity means the highest possible active example showing the divine kindness and grace and the goodness of God. So it's not just written it in a, in a book for us to try and grapple with and understand by our own thoughts and our own imaginations. In the gift of his son to us, he has given us the highest possible example. And this is an example in action, not just an example that's written on a blackboard. This is something for us to visibly see. The gift of his own son is the highest possible example of him showing divine kindness and grace and goodness to his people and that's what that phrase means god showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him this is real love it is not that we loved god but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins that's 1 John 4, 9 and 10. That was the guarantee of all the other blessings. So as I started with, in Christ we have all of the blessings. All the gifts that God is going to give to his children are all secured in the gift of Jesus Christ himself and what he accomplished on the cross. So he is the guarantee of all other blessings. As the apostle argued from the greater to the less, assuring us that Christ is at once the pledge and the channel of every other mercy. So if we have Christ in our lives, 
he is the pledge that all the blessings, all the promises that God has made in Christ are yes and amen to the believer, are yes and amen to the sons and daughters, the yes and amen to the brothers and sisters of Christ. He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things, it says in Romans 8, verse 32. God did not withhold his choicest treasure, the darling of his bosom, but he freely yielded him up, and the love which did not spare him will not begrudge anything that is good for his people. So the love that is in Christ Jesus, the love that God had for him, the love that God has for us in giving him up for, for the purpose of the children of God to come to himself, everything that is in him will not be begrudged to his people. And that's a promise. And that's something that we need to stand on because I, I do believe that there are, there are Christian people that walk through this life that, that don't understand what it is that we have in Christ. Everything that we need for godliness, everything that we need to get through those trials and temptations, everything that we need to get through this life as it throws its challenges and its valleys and it's hard, dark, cloud times. Everything that we need, all the promises are found in Christ. And God will not be grudges, giving us any good thing. And let's make an emphasis on that. He will not be grudge, giving us any good thing. Anything that his will is for our lives. Any, anything of his goodness towards us, he will not be grudge, giving us. I, I put a post on, on Facebook last night about, about prayer. The fact that we need to be continuously, continuously in prayer. Continuously in prayer. Importunity, as it says um, in Luke 11. That we are to go to God with our, our prayers as long as we're praying into the will of God. And we're to be persistent until we get an answer. Now, it may be that the answer may not come uh, all at once. Or it may not, not even start to appear. We may not see the fruits for a season but if we continually ask seek and knock the promise is that you will find it will be given to you the door shall be opened that fruit will eventually come into your life and god does not begrudge us any good thing and that's the point that it's trying to make it's 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 phenomenal the promises that god has in christ and they will all come about Ryan's put there that he was talking to and chatting to Sue about this yesterday. We, we have a certainty in Christ. That's why there is no fear. That's why it, there is no worry. You know, every day of its own has its own cares, but they're all answered and they're all sustained in Christ. Cast your burdens onto him for he cares for you and we will find our everything, our all in all in Christ, the gift that God gave to us. Wonderful promise. Let's move on to number two. The gift. The gift of his spirit. The son is God's all inclusive gift. So the son includes everything. As Manton said. Christ comes not to us as empty handed. His person and his benefits and not divided. So Christ is not divided from his benefits. It's a, it's a complete package. He came to purchase all manner of blessings for us. The greatest of these is the Holy Spirit, who applies and communicates what the Lord Jesus obtained for his people. And this is a very, very vital and important point. You know, we, we, we've preached in church many times on the gift of the Holy Spirit and what it's not, you know, the fanaticism that we've seen over the 90s and to some extent to the, the days that we're living in around, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and people falling over the floor, uh, barking like dogs, all that, all that stuff that, you know, we, we, we don't, um, we, we've put to bed. The gift of the Holy Spirit is given to the believer in order that we can live the life that, that God has, has ordained for, for, for us as his children. 
and the gift of the Holy Spirit is given by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, as we'll read in a moment. So let's read that again. The greatest of these, that's the blessings that comes through Christ, is the Holy Spirit, who applies and communicates what the Lord Jesus obtained for his people. This is how the application of salvation and the application of everything that, that comes in the redemption of Christ, this is how it's applied to the believer's life. Application is by the Holy Spirit. Christ obtain it and the, 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 the truths and the reality of it is applied to all believers. God pardoned and justified his elect in Old Testament times on the ground of the atonement which his son would make at the appointed time. On the basis he communicated to them the Spirit. So there's a, there's a couple of verses there that it quotes Numbers 9.25. Now, when I, when I looked, looked that up, Numbers 9.25 does not exist. So I don't, I'm not quite sure what passage that was because I spent a bit of time trying to find it, but I couldn't find it. So we will turn to Nehemiah 9, 9 verse 20 uh, just to have a read of what that says. So Nehemiah 9 verse 20. Bear with me, the pages are sticking together. Nehemiah 9 verse 20 says, Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manner from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. So that's just backing up what, what's just being said, that God in the Old Testament gave the spirit in order to communicate to them. Otherwise, none would have been regenerated or fitted for communion with God or unable to bring forth spiritual fruit. Even in the Old Testament, you know, men and women through the law were just thinking that they could obtain favour through their own hands. Yes, they, was, um, they, were, they were giving the sacrifices. Yes, they were doing and keeping the feasts. But they were doing it thinking that the works of their own hands was what was benefiting them. When actually... It was its obedience to that through the enabling of the power of the Holy Spirit that, that, that brought them the truths that actually this is about this is about obedience. It's not about what we're doing. It's about us doing it because God's requested us to and we're doing it out of obedience because it's it's the thing itself. It's not what we do, as we're going to carry on reading a bit little bit later. But he th but, but but he then wrought more secretly rather than in demonstrations and in power. So the Old Testament was more in secret to the chosen people of Israel. It came as the Jew, rather than was poured out copiously. It was restricted to Israel, rather than communicated to the Gentiles also. The Spirit in his fullness was God's ascension gift to Christ. That's Acts 2.33, and again we'll turn to that just to confirm what's being said. Acts 2, verse 33. Russell says, could be Numbers 11, 25. So Acts 2, 33 says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see. So when Christ ascended, he was, he was promised to receive the Holy Ghost in its fullness. And when he, was, when he went to the Father, he received that. Not that he needed it there to be the Son in eternity, but he received it in, 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 the, um, in order that he could give it to his church, to give it to his people, which we're going to read next. So the Spirit in his fullness was God's ascension gift to Christ. He gave it to Christ and Christ's coronation gift to his church. So when Christ was coronated on his throne in heaven, when he ascended, he was, this gift was there and given to him for his church. So John 7, 16 verse 7 says, John 16, 7.
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. You remember that Jesus was talking to the disciples and he says, I must go. And they said, well, we, no, don't go, stay with us. And he said, it's imperative that I go. For if I don't go, the promise of the Holy Spirit, I won't be able, to, you won't be able to receive him. It's only by me going to the Father that you will be able to receive this gift. So the gift of the Spirit was purchased for his people by Christ. That's Galatians three, thirteen to fourteen, and again we'll read that just to, just to get that, in its context. Galatians three, thirteen to fourteen. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, "Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree," that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. The gift of the Spirit was purchased for his people by Christ. It was purchased at the cross. And note carefully the second that in verse 14. He came in order that we would receive this gift. Every blessing we receive is through the merits of of Christ through the merits and the mediation of Christ we we cannot claim anything of our own accord we can't go into that room of prayer and say father god i claim this i claim that i claim the other everything that we receive is through the merits and the mediation of Christ nothing to do with our own abilities nothing to do with any goodness of our own or any any actions that we done that that we may think that we we are meritorious in our own efforts we receive because of what Christ has done and it's important that we always remember that we are not given anything because we plead God of our own of our own behalf we come to him in the name of Christ that's why we say in the name of Jesus in Christ's name we bring this prayer in the name of Jesus because of his merits not because we we're, we're pleading um, and we just quote, we're just quoting his name because it's like, we, you know, we've got a, I don't know, a, a friend who can help us get to wherever we want to get. We, we, we say in his name because it is in him, in his merits and because of what he has done. So the Holy Spirit is a gift to us and it's and it's a gift to us through what Christ has done himself. So when we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and everything else that's linked with it, we have to remember that you know when we're laying on, when we talk about the laying on of hands and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is not the person who's laying on of hands that is causing the baptism to happen. Christ is the one that gives the Holy Spirit, and we need to remember that because there is some very very false teachings about the Holy Spirit out there, that's that's got a lot of places in a lot of, you know, strange strange activities number three the gift of eternal life for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord Romans 6 23 there is a double antithesis between those things so antithesis means a direct opposite so there's a there's a double direct opposite between these two things. First, the justice of God will be rendered unto the wicked. So sorry, let me say that again. First, the justice of God will render unto the wicked what is due for their sins. So we were talking about last week we were going through the wrath of God, a very um difficult subject to talk about, but what we what we have to recognize is that those who are wicked will receive the reward of their wickedness, the wrath of God. So there is, God will render a, um, a pure justice upon wickedness. He will render to the wicked what is due for their sins. But, it says, and this is the antithesis, 
the opposition, the, the, the opposites. But his mercy bestows upon his people what they do not deserve. So those whom God calls, those whom God justifies, those whom God will, will glorify, upon them he disposes mercy, even though they do not deserve it. So the wicked receive what they do not deserve, but those who are called receive what they do not deserve. Sorry, let me put that again because I put it wrong. The wicked receive what they do deserve. They are justly punished for their wickedness. But those who have mercy bestowed upon them receive that of which they, which they don't deserve. It's grace. All of God, none of man. Second, the second antithesis. Eternal death follows as a natural and in the inevitable consequences for what is in and done by its objects. So eternal death, that's our separation from God, comes as, as a, a, an inevitable consequence to what we have done on this earth. At the sin that we've committed, the separation that that causes between ourselves and God is, is what causes our eternal death. And it, it, it comes as a natural consequence. It's, it, it's a consequence to all men in sin. But not so eternal life. For it is bestowed without any consideration of something in or from its subject. So eternal life is given regardless of what man and woman have done. It is done purely by the grace of God. It is communicated and sustained gratuitously. So God gives it, communicates it, and more importantly, he sustains it, this eternal life which begins when we're born again. It is communicated and it is sustained gratuitously, freely. It's given. We do not have any... Um, we, we don't pay for it at all. It's, it's freely given. It's unwarranted on our behalf. That's what gratuitously means. It means given freely or given unwarranted. So Linda's just put, mercy is not getting what we deserved. Grace is getting what we did not deserve. Abs mercy is getting what we, is not getting what we deserve. So, you know, we, we have a very merciful God. We're all, we are all deserved of punishment and separation from God because of the sin that we commit. The wages of sin is death. And as we've just read there, that comes upon all men. But by the mercy and the grace of God, we receive that which Christ has bought for us upon the cross, what he's purchased for us. That's redemption. That is a, a washing away of our sins. That is a, He's paid our punishment he has taken the, the punishment upon his own shoulders in order that our sins can be removed and that God can now look favourably upon us. That's grace. Natural because God warmed Adam. Let me just press this. Natural that God warmed Adam that if he disobeyed and ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that he would surely die. Hence death is the natural consequence to us all. That first death and then the eternal death which comes from it if we continue outside of Christ. So where did we get to? It is communicated and sustained gratuitously. Eternal life is a free bounty, not only unmerited but also unsolicited by us. For in every instance God has reason to say, I am found by those who sought me not. So unsolicited, we don't... Of our natural nature, and let me tell you, this is a truth, whether, whether some people want to accept it or not. Of our human nature, we will not search after God ourselves. It's not within our makeup. We are at enmity with God. We, we do not have natural desire in our flesh at all to live a godly life. And it is him who has come to us. Not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us. And he has made that first move in Christ to pay the price of redemption for all those that he has called according to his purpose. It, um, I am found, uh, God, has, God has reason to say, I am found by the, those who sought me not. Isaiah 65, 1, 
and also saying um, confer with Romans 3.11. The recipient is a wholly passive. And that passive means he has no part to play in it and this thing just happens to him. He does not act, but is acted upon when he is brought from death into life. Eternal life, a spiritual life now, from our point of being born again. John it tells us in the Gospel of John, doesn't it, that those who, 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 who pass from one life to the next have not died. They continue in Christ. They just move on. Eternal life, they will, they will never die. A spiritual life now, a life of glory hereafter, is sovereignly and freely bestowed by God. So let's just pick up on that point because there are people that don't like this thought of these things being being done to them without without the person giving God the permission to do it. Well let's let's just let's, let's look at this logically. If we're lost and dead in trespasses and sins, where do we go from there? The answer is nowhere. We can't we can't raise ourselves, we can't become alive again by our own power. It tells us in Ephesians, we were dead, not breathing, lifeless in a spiritual sense, dead in our trespasses and sins. Now God was would have been just to leave every single person in that state. He had no reason, as we've read through this book, as we've gained understanding through the scriptures that we've read, absolutely no requirement um, he, he had no reason to save any and yet in his own goodness he is acted in his own plans and purposes to raise up a people for himself and he comes and does this action of his own accord and yes the person is passive because they're, they're dead in the trespasses and sins and he raises them out of that, that death just like Christ called out to Lazarus in the tomb, come out, come out, this is the Holy Spirit working in the life of that dead spiritual person. Wake up, come out, and he's giving us life, and then we receive that new being, that new life that is in Christ, and we are changed, and we continue to be changed from glory to glory. And that's a wonderful work of God, and that's why we're completely passive. We can't, there's nothing, we have no part to play in it, and God does it all freely, bestows not not offers but he bestows it upon us yet it is also a blessing communicated by him unto his elect because the lord jesus christ paid the price of redemption so there is there is an action that's actually been taken place but it's not ours it's that of christ so it is communicated to us because of an action but that is the action of Christ who paid the price of our redemption yes it is actually dispensed by Christ I give unto them not merely offer eternal life I give unto them eternal life it says in John ten twenty eight, and also see John 17 verse 3 so let's pick up on some of this here Russell says, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seek after God. Yeah, we've gone, we, we, you know, we've picked up that week after week. Tim said, don't we decide to follow Jesus? As I've just said, Tim, and you know, we've, uh, we've said this, you know, many times. In, in, in our spiritual being, in, in our flesh, sorry, in our flesh, we are unable to make a choice for God. We, we're lost, we're, we're dead in trespasses of sins, as it said in Ephesians 2. We are incapable of understanding anything spiritual, as Paul tells us in Corinthians and again in Romans. We're not able to, to, to decide anything of a, of, a, of a spiritual nature from a fleshly position because we're at enmity with God. So God has to work in our lives and he does that by bringing in the gift of the Holy Spirit that we read about in point two and he stirs the man, he regenerates him, he changes him. And then we become able then to, to see these spiritual things. And to make a decision for Christ is based upon God's love for us. We, we don't just decide to accept Christ or not. Because, you know, again, that, that we're going back to what he's just said here. 
God bestows eternal life. Christ said, I give it to them. Give it, not is making an offer that you can either come and accept it or not. He gives it to his, his, his disciples. He doesn't go giving it out to everybody else. This eternal life is for the people of God. Those who are saved by the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. It's not for every person. It is for those who belong to Christ. Those who he came to purchase. Those whom God has called from the very foundation of the world, of the earth, as we've read in the weeks gone by. Russell's put John 6, 4, 4, replying to Tim, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. That just confirms everything that we've just said. So we move on. Christ paid the price of redemption. Yes, it is actually dispensed by Christ. I give unto them, not merely offer, eternal life. John 28, see also 17 and 3. So I think that's Ryan replying another another reply. We need to be quickened by the Spirit. That's regeneration. God quickens us and then we repent and turn to God. In simple terms, brother, he gives us a heart that wants him. Absolutely. And, and that's what you put just there, Tim. Yes, we accept it, but we accept it because he's taken away that heart of stone that we have taken it away removed it we and he's placed in it a, a heart of flesh and he's changed our desires you know and i'm sure we can all reflect back on the days of even early profession of christianity when when we professed christ but our actions and our lifestyle were totally in opposition that antithesis as we were talking about earlier total opposites we profess christ but yet our 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 desire for him was absolutely um non-existent but but as god brings us to that point of being born again then that's when we start to be able to understand these spiritual things repentance is part of our is part of the is this part of the change tim from from being a, a, a man of the flesh to a man of the spirit we have to be quickened first by God. And that's the born again. It says, it says in John 3, nobody, when Christ talked to Nicodemus, nobody can see the kingdom unless he is born again. Until we realise who we are outside of Christ, that wretched man in sin, that wretched man who is totally against God, that wretched man who, who wants nothing to do with God, that wretched man who has sinned continuously against God. Until we come to a knowledge of an understanding of that, then we're not going. We, we won't repent away from it until we understand how much we've offended God, and how much we deserve the wrath of God. And that will not come unless we have been regenerated. It can't unless the, unless we are born again of the Spirit. All these spiritual things are just a nonsense, as, as as Paul tells us in Romans. We cannot understand the things of the Spirit, and so we have to be quickened. We have to be born again first, and then, as a result of that, we are then told repent it's part of the gospel the gospel comes the gospel orders us repent the call to repentance goes out to every man but only those who are quickened by the spirit will repent those who have do not have ears to hear and do not have our heart to receive will not repent they will not find repentance because it's not it, 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 it they will just carry on walking of their own flesh and their own desires and so therefore as russell's put salvation is a hundred percent work of god from start to finish God loved us, then we love God. Let's move on to the next point. The spirit, sorry, the gift of spiritual understanding. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding that we may know him. That is true, 1 John 5.20. What is communicated to the saint when he is born again is wholly spiritual and exactly suitable, suited sorry, for taking in the scriptural knowledge of God. Christ. So this is just reiterating the poor, uh, the um, the point we just made. The things that are communicated to the saint, that's the born again person, when he is born again, is wholly spiritual, all spiritual, 
and it's exactly suited for, t for taking in the scriptural knowledge of Christ. So when we're born again, we are, we are given this gift of spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding of the things of Christ. So it's not an entirely new faculty which is then imparted, but rather the renewing or the regenerating of the original one. Fitting it for the apprehensions of new objects. It consists of an internal illumination, a divine light that shows in our, sh shines in our hearts, enabling us to discern the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. So though we are not now admitted into a corporeal sight of Christ, so corporeal is a, is a bodily um, existence, a physical body, we are not... Um, admitted into a corporeal we don't see Christ's body physically now at this moment in time yet he is made a living reality to those who have been quickened into newness of life and this is the point Tim that the, the, the living reality can only be to a person that's born again it can only be to a person who has been quickened into this newness of life by the Spirit of God and his understanding of spiritual things is then a gift from God himself through Christ by this divine renewing of the understanding we can now perceive the peerless excellency and perfect superability of Christ we couldn't understand that before and now we can gaze upon Christ and see in him in all of his beauty in all of his excellency in all of his wonder in all of his majesty in in all of his awesomeness to use the word properly you know we've quoted that many times awesome is, is, is flitted about far too easily in the church today everybody's awesome awesomeness belongs to God and in him alone and we only, be, we only come to this revelation of Christ and you know this has been impressed on me so heavily as we read in this book about our view of God this is what this is all about God in his goodness to the people that he has called and, and, and made his children in Christ has given us such a, a wonderful um, gift that we can now know him through, through Christ and through the word. We can begin to understand these attributes because he, he wants to show himself to us. He wants us to know him in, in, in his majesty and his wonder and in his splendor, in his aseity, in his goodness, in his kindness. We, he wants us to know what his, 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 his mercy is. He wants us to know what his wrath is and, and understand it to such a degree and brothers and sisters, as you're watching this, I do plead with you to, to get this into your heart because Christianity is not just about sitting in a seat Sunday after Sunday and hearing the preacher speak. The preacher is there for a purpose, is there to bring the word of God into your lives, into my life, and is there to do a job. But the responsibility of the relationship that we have with our God and Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is down to us and we we should long to to know God to this depth you know we, we, we it tells us um, that we will never know him fully until we see him face to face but we also read that you know that he gives us the spirit in order that we can know the heights and the depths and, and the breadths and the widths of the love of God it's something that we should experience and it's something that as Christians we should have a passion and a desire to, to long and chase after this understanding of this wonderful relationship. I was reading um, the last chapter of um, Amongst God Giants or Quest for Godliness last night and it talks about, um, uh, talks about this experiential element of God, this experimental as another word, that we shouldn't be frightened of 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 having an experiential relationship with God. That's what it's all about. That's what revival is. When it comes to the church, firstly, it's about God coming to his people and, and making himself known again in the power that he that he's re revealed himself in the past. And he does that through Christ. He does it through his word. He does it through the preaching of the word. And he does it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it has an experiential effect on our lives. And And nobody should tell us any different. We're not to be monks um, locking away ourselves away in, in, in a monastery and you know trying to live a perfect, godly, 
holy life by our own actions. This thing is about experiencing God and having him give all his fullness in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, changing us from glory to glory. What a wonderful message. What a wonderful God that we serve, that he allows us in all of our weakness to have this relationship with us. Let's continue. Um, by this divine renewing of the understanding, we can now perceive the peerless excellency and perfect suitability of Christ. The knowledge we have of him is seated in the understanding. So the knowledge that we gain is seated in our understanding, in our minds and in, in, in our understanding. And that fires up affections and it sanctifies our will. It changes our will. It changes it to the, to the good things that God wants us to do, the, his will. And it raises the mind into being fixed upon him. Let me ask you, and I'm asking myself, have you had this experience? Because this is vital. Has your, has your mind been changed has your desires and your will been changed to the point where now you're fixing your whole thoughts and imaginations and minds and purposes upon the living God? Has he come in and changed you to that degree? Because that, that is what you're looking for in your own life. When, when, it, when Paul tells you to examine yourself, it's not... Examine yourself to see how many prayers you've said or how many chapters you've read this week. No, not to examine yourself how many years you've been at church. Not to examine yourself on how many sermons you may have preached or how many Bible studies you may have, may have done. What he's doing is say, examine yourselves to know whether you are in Christ. Have you had this change in your life? Do you now desire holiness rather than the flesh? Do you now desire to fix your um, affections upon things of God rather than things of the world? Is you now your mind focused upon God? Is it fixed upon him? You know, some people would call this, and I'm talking about Christians, and I've, I've, had, it said, I've had it said about me. And it's an insult. You know, you're too serious. Don't need, you don't need to be this serious. God is awesome, friends. And he deserves to have our whole focus and minds being fixed upon him. Upon what he's done. Upon his majesty. And what a lifestyle it is to lead. It has that effect on our lives where we just... Pursuing holiness, as it, as it tells us in Hebrews. Pursuing it. Not necessarily always reaching that perfection that we would want in our own spiritual desires. But he enables us to want to pursue it. It's amazing. Amazing. When I remember back the lifestyle that I, that I lived of chasing after... This, that and the other, chasing after the world, living in a lifestyle of, of, of drink on a Saturday night because it's the only thing that's satisfied. And now to know that God's changed my heart, that I want to, I want to legitimately chase after and, and put all my focus upon God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, Tim, that we're talking about. That's the work that he does in our lives. That's the change. That's the new man. So is your mind being focused upon him? Such a spiritual understanding is not attained by any efforts of ours, but is a supernatural bestowment, a divine gift compared, sorry, conferred upon the elect, which admits them into the secrets of the Most High. This understanding that we receive, it's a privilege, dear friends. He is admitting us into the secrets, the wonders of, of his own will and he is handing them over to you and saying dwell on these things seek these things fix your life upon these things i am giving to you the gift of this understanding of what it is that i've done through my son jesus christ what i am going to do at his return he's purchased a people which is coming back for himself and we will dwell with him eternally 
Wonderful. Let's move on. We've, dwelt, we've spent a lot of time, but that's important. Important. The gift of faith. The gift of faith. Faith is a gift, as we read in Ephesians. The salvation of God does not actually become ours until we believe in, rest upon and receive Christ as a personal saviour. But as we cannot see without both sight and light, neither can we believe until life and faith are divinely communicated to us. Back to your point again, Tim. Until we, uh, until we have that communicated to us, we're not able to believe. We're not able to receive salvation. So Christ is a personal say. Uh, sorry, but as we cannot see without light, sight and light, remember that Satan is is the one that is is fully in control in this world. It's been handed over to him at the moment in time, and he blinds those who are wicked, who are in wickedness. But God is the one that brings light. God is the one that brings sight. And it's as a, another thing I posted the other night. Just as just as that. Um, hold that Satan has on the wicked in blindness, that he is the one that blinds, surely there is only a more supreme and superior being that, that gives eternal life, sight and light. It's not something we can, we, can, we can imagine or bring about ourselves. It's got to be done by that, that supreme and higher being. So it says, neither can we believe until life and faith are divinely communicated to us. According, accordingly, for by grace are you saved, through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8-9 Arminians would make the second clause of verse 8 a mere repetition of the first. So let's just go over that. For by grace are ye saved, and through faith, and not of yourself. So what he's saying is that our minions take that second phrase, and not of yourselves, and just align it with you are saved through faith, making it the same proposition. However, it says, and in less, and in less ex expressive and emphatic language, since salvation is by grace, it is superfluous, so it's pointless to add that it is, it is not of yourselves in, in relation to that first phrase. You don't need to add anything else because he's already told you that salvation is by grace. So, but because faith is our act, that, that is, we, we do have an act of faith. That is something that, that we do that is essential on our behalf. It was necessary so that the excellence of it should not be arrogated. That's being made um, the action of the creature or the, you know, the ability of the creature, but ascribed unto God. So what he's saying is that the, the second clause of this passage is a separate thing. He's saying that faith is not of yourselves. Not that grace is not of yourself. Is, no, let me re leave word like our, our minions would make the second clause of verse 8 a mere repetition of the first and less expressive and emphatic. Since salvation is by grace, it is superfluous to add it is not of yourselves, but because faith is our act, it was necessary so that the excellence of it should not be arrogated by the creature but ascribed unto God. To point out that faith is not of ourselves. So he, he, he reiterates not of yourselves about the faith, not of the first clause. So faith is not of ourselves, even though it is an action that we take. It's an action that we make. That faith is given to us as a gift by God. Let's just have a look to see what's, what's being said here. All the great healings of Christ and the apostles are pointing to salvation. The Pharisees themselves said never in the history of Israel had they seen anyone born blind to see. Jesus enables people to spiritually walk, hear, see and be cleansed of leprosy and sin. Yep. 
Philippians 2.13, for it is God which worketh in you to both will, to will and to do of his good pleasure. So although although um, we're going to, got to go back because it says repentance leads to salvation. Repentance is part of our salvation. Repentance is, is, is what God grants, as, as, as Ryan's already put. He grants repentance to us through faith, which we receive by the gospel. We have preached on this several, uh, uh, probably a month or so ago, that um, the, the, the word of God the, is, it's, is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe and that faith leads to more faith and faith that is a result of the hearing of the gospel which is the power of God if you work it backwards so God is the one who brings the power into our lives through the gospel who opens up our ears grants us faith which then we work in repentance and then we move on repenting 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 which will then sanctify 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 and which will then lead us to 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 glory um in in the new life that we have full glorification it's all a process you see it's it's a process of, that god has done himself not that we can work up from our own um abilities or understanding we have to be we have to be enlightened by god first the very faith which we receive Sorry, the, the, the very faith which receives a gratuitous salvation is not the unassisted act of man's own will. As God must give me breath before I can breathe, so faith before I believe. We can't come to God without the faith. Compare also faith which is by him, Acts 3.16, who believe according to the works of his mighty power, Ephesians 1 verse 19. Through the faith of the operation of God, Colossians 2.12, who by him do believe in God, 1 Peter 1.21. All these, all these verses pointing to the fact which, means we, which shows we have to be given this gift of faith in order to believe, which will then have its outworking in the child of God. I'll just leave you to read these comments because they're all about the same subject. Um, so repentance lead, does lead to salvation, but we we have no desire to re, or, or power to repent unless God gives us gives it to us. Um, I'll leave you to read the rest of them because there, there's some very good points being made there. But it's going going over all the other stuff. So have a read um, as I move on to this this last last section, the gift of repentance, which we now now moving on to. The gift of repentance, that's, that's, that's what we need. While it is the bound duty of every sinner to repent, Acts 17.30. So as I said earlier, the gospel that goes out, the call that goes out for repentance is to every single man, woman and child. This is a universal call to all that live. Not one is excluded from this call. But those who repent are the ones that are given the gift of repentance. It's a demand, but there are those which, which, as we know, refuse the call of repentance. And then they will be judged in their wickedness. Let's, let's carry on and read and see what it says. While it is the duty, while it is the bound duty of every sinner to repent, Acts 17.30, for ought he not to cease from thee and abhor his rebellion against God when he's been told where he stands? Yet he is completely under the blinding power of sin that a miracle of grace is necessary before he will do so. Remember what I've just said about Satan. I think it's 1 Corinthians 4, remembering Satan is the ruler of this world and he blinds the blinding power of sin is the fact that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And we walk in that way. And whilst we're in that complete sin and we, we're dead to anything else, we are only walking one way. And that is an eternal separation, that eternal death 
that we that we read about earlier. That's the only way that we're walking. And so in order for us to come out of that, because we can't see, we can't act, it is necessary for a miracle of grace to come before we can before we can see, before we are changed. So it says it is the ho uh, a, before he will do so a broken and a trans, trans con, contrite spirit are of God's providing a broken and a contrite spirit are of God's providing he he breaks he breaks us and he provides us through that breaking with a contrite spirit it is the Holy Spirit who illuminates the understanding to perceive the heinousness of sin. Those who are born again have, have been born of the Spirit. You must be born again in order to see the kingdom. Do you get what, what, what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus? You must be born again, otherwise you just continue in your blindness. A broken and a contrite spirit of God's providing, it is the Holy Spirit who illuminates the understanding to perceive the heinousness of sin, the heart to loathe it, and the will to repudiate it, to, to want to be to push it out of the way and to deaden it. Faith and repentance are the first evidence of spiritual life. So faith, repentance. We're given faith by God, we are born again, repentance comes, and they're the first signs of this spiritual life that God has, has awakened in us. For when God quickens a sinner, he convicts him of the evil sin, causes him to hate it, moves him to sorrow over and turn from it. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understanding, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the disgrace of my youth. That's Jeremiah 31 19 so after he strayed God showed it to him he repented after that he came to understanding after that he beat his breast in further repentance I, I, I was ashamed and humiliated this is all the work of God because I be, bore a disgrace in his youth when God when God opens up a mind you know we, 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 this is what it says blessed are those who mourn that's the place that you get to and that's the that's the first that's the first part of the of the the beatitudes that, that we're going to be looking at, you know, later down the line. Blessed are those who mourn. You can't move any further forward unless you mourn. A prince and a saviour to give repentance to to Israel. Acts five, thirty one. Then has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Granted repentance unto life. Acts eleven verse eighteen. If God perhaps will give them repentance, 2 Timothy 2, 25. So that's all reiterating that the gift of repentance comes from God. I don't know whether I've missed any comments here. Yeah, super. When, when the Lord reveals himself to you, that's how it is. You grieve because of your sin. You grieve because of your past sin. And then from that point onwards, you, 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 you grieve when you do sin. And that's why you, you start on this process of mortifying the sin and, and mortifying the flesh in order that, you know, that grieving process, it'll be there. But as, as you're moving through a Christian life, that you should be at a point where you're not having to have the have your heart broken that many times because you should be progressing and getting closer to the lord and 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 mortifying the flesh more and more so let's move on to number 7 i don't know where we are with time but we're near, we're nearly done now anyway number 7 the gift of grace i thank my god always on your behalf for the grace of god which is given you by Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4. Grace is used there in its widest sense, including 
all the benefits of Christ's merits and mediations, where we started with. We started by saying that all the blessings and the benefits to us are yes and amen in Christ. And the grace that comes to us includes all of these things. So grace is used there in its widest sense, including all the benefits of Christ's merits and mediation, providential or spiritual, temporal or eternal. It includes regenerating, sanctifying, preserving grace, as well as every particular grace of the new nature, faith, hope and love. So this, um, I'll call it a package, but that's not, it's not a very good phrase. But what Christ has purchased, that's the better phrase, for you, for you and for me, for the Christian believer, for the child of God, on the cross is all these um, regenerated gifts of sanctification, preservation in the graces that he gives us, as well as particular, particular graces of a new nature and then faith and hope and love. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, 4 verse 7. That is according as he is pleased to bestow and not according to our ability or asking. So the measure that we're talking about of the gift of Christ is, is talking about the measure of Christ. It's not talking about the measure that we have or the measure that Christ measures us with. The grace is given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And he is abundant in his gifts. That is according to the um, as he pleased to bestow and not according to our ability or asking yes we should go we should ask but it's not dependent upon upon that it's dependent dependent upon the measure of the gift of christ therefore we have no cause to be proud you know the, the 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 gifts and the graces that are poured out upon us are poured out upon us because of his good pleasure not because of the amount of asking that we've done, not because of the amount of good works that we've done, not because we may have been a regenerated person and we're now, we're now sinning less, but these graces are still about Christ. They're still about Him giving us freely with no, with, with no claim on our behalf. So we cannot become proud. We cannot be, become boastful of anything that we do, even if we believe that we've stood in the pulpit and we've preached the finest sermon of our lives, finest sermon of our lives, we have nothing to be proud or boastful about. Everything is given us to God, by God. Whatever grace we have to resist the devil or patiently bear affliction or overcome the world is from him. He is our sustenance. He is our all in all. He is our provider. He is the one in which when we are weak, we are strong. He, he, we become sufficient, sufficient in his sufficiency. As Paul tells us, we are sufficient for all things in Christ, but it doesn't rely anything to do with us whatsoever. If we resist the devil, if we bear our afflictions patiently, if we overcome the world, as John tells us, our thanks and our, our gratitude should go to Christ and Christ alone. He has held us fast, as we sung, sung on Sunday, by the power of his Holy Spirit. He has given us that ability in Christ to do it. Not that we've, you know, not that we've told the devil what to do, not because we've bound him, not because we've, we've got any ability of our own spiritual beings to do anything. It's all about what Christ has purchased and what he has given us as a gift. Whatever obedience we perform. Now, I'm taking it a step further. We have been fitted, dear friends, for good works. We have been fitted to live a, a life of godliness. But whatever obedience we perform, again, if we, if, we, if we think that it's anything to do with us, we're no different to the, the to children of Israel in the Old Testament when they was going doing sacrifices and thinking they were okay. We're no different to the scribes and the Pharisees who thought they were, they were well because all the pots and that were washed and the hands were washed and they were, got all the phylacteries and they were seen praying on the corners. No, 
whatever obedience we perform, we're enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever obedience we perform, whatever <laughs> whatever re- devotion, whatever worship that we give to render to, to Him, it's all coming from Him as a gift of the Holy Spirit. Whatever sacrifice we make, it, 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 this life we're living, it's not, it's not down to these. It's down all down to the gifts of grace that God gives in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Whatever sacrifice, whatever worship, whatever honour we render to God, we have been enabled to do it by the gift of grace in our lives. Therefore we must confess, for all things come of you, and of your own we have given to you. 1 Chronicles 29.14 Everything is of God and everything that we offer him belongs firstly to him and has been given to us. We offer nothing to him that does not belong to him. Nothing. Our gratitude, our thanks, our worship, our praise. I'm just blown away by this chapter. I really am. The gifts of God to his children. And remember that verse in, in Romans Romans 11. The gifts of God are irrevocable. And, you know, many people will say that's talking about Israel. That's a different topic. But the, 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 the emphasis and the context of, of what it means applies here. The gifts of God are irrevocable. They will not be taken away from the child of God. And I hope that this chapter has blessed you. And I hope that it has opened your eyes to the wonderful attribute of giving that God has towards those who are his. I've been blessed. I I really have been blessed by both sharing and reading. And, you know, I'm I'm going to be thinking on this all night. Thank you for your interaction. There's there's obviously still still questions to keep going around. Um, in terms of that topic but we'll we'll deal with that in more depth um, at another point and it will come uh, we've we dealt with it tonight but you know we'll we'll go over it again and I, um, so Chris has put on uh, just to go through the comments you cannot repent unless the Lord has moved upon you because as it says in scripture there is none that seeketh after God no not one um, yeah that's it in a nutshell. You know, it's all a gift of God, dear friends. All a gift of God. Let's finish in prayer. Father God, I want to thank you for tonight. Indeed, I want to thank you for for all that you've given us. I want to thank you that, you know, even though we we were sinful creatures who hated, rebelled, were at enmity with you, that you in your goodness and mercy and kindness saw fit to have mercy upon a people whom you declared were yours and that from all of eternity Father you have working out your plans and your purposes and and we want to say tonight from the bottom of our hearts indeed I, I want to say tonight Father if nobody else does from the bottom of my heart that I thank you for the grace that you have poured into my life, for the giftings that you shower upon us to enable us to walk this life, to enable us to see the goodness that you have, you, that you have showered upon us, to enable us to walk the life that you have called us to, to enable us to, to, to know you in all the fullness that we can in this body that we live in. Father, I pray that you'll grant more. I pray that as a church, Father God, as we continue to meet together and study your word, that you will develop us into a church that relies upon you, into a church that has its candlestick firmly remained and on fire by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we will not walk into error and that our focus, as we've read tonight, our focus, our minds as individuals and as a corporate body would always and only be upon you. Father, we are in hard times and difficult times and we need you in our lives. We need you to, we, we need you to illuminate yourselves to us. We need you to keep us. We need you to hold us fast. 
We need, we need you to, that in our weakness, Lord, that you can be our strength. We need these gifts that we've read about tonight. Not these fandangled things that everybody anchors after, Father God, but the gifts that make us real children of God. Father, I thank you again, and I pray that you'll be with us, that you'll bless us until we meet again. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining. It's, it has really been a privilege, and it always is a privilege, and I do thank God for giving me the, the, um, the, the privilege of, of, of sharing this with you. And I look forward to seeing you again, hopefully, on Sunday. God bless, and may he keep you, and may he cause his face to shine upon you and bring you peace. In his name. Amen.